As I mentioned in the intro, I'm delighted to have Vin as a guest on the podcast today. I've had some fantastic opportunities to spend time in person with Vin. And first off, I'll say hello. Good to have you here, Vin. Lovely to see you again. It's been such a while. Great to be here, Jim. Super excited for the conversation today. So I'll, I'll take people back a little bit of time for the benefits of those listening in. So I actually met Vin in Barcelona. I don't think when it was, was it like 2018, 19, something like that? Right in that area. Right in that, I want to say 18. And, and we, we were both, we, we both had the opportunity to be on stage. I was talking about Google ads and Vin was basically putting the business that he was working with at the time up on stage and he was bearing his soul to Ezra Firestone and Molly, what was Molly's name? I can't remember. Pittman, Molly Pittman. Pittman. And it, um, it, was, called, it was called the hot seat. The hot they, seat. They put me on the hot seat <laughs> in the middle of a heat wave. So basically it was Vin bearing his soul to Molly and Ezra for their amusement and fun and the audience to see how Vin was running his business. And I, th I thought that Ezra and Molly did a pretty good job of giving Vin some good ideas and so on and so on. But I was sitting in the audience watching him present and talk about the, the challenges and issues that the company that he was working with at the time, which was a company called Smoothie Box, had at that particular point. And, and what really sprung into my mind was what the, the product was designed to do was missing from what was actually being discussed when they were on stage. I remember watching a YouTube video quite a while back with uh, Clay Christensen about the job to be done and the McDonald's milkshake. And I'll leave a, a link in the show notes as to what that's all about. But it was a phenomenal video for me. I, I reached out to Vin and said, hey, look, I think this video really encapsulates a lot about what I think your product does in the market. And I think the positioning is different. And from there, we got to the point where we went backwards and forwards a little bit. We got to the point where I started to do a bit of consulting and then eventually got to the point where we were looking at the possibility of me helping out. So I went over to Florida. I, at the time, I was probably about 70 pounds heavier than I am now. So I took to walking along the beach in Florida and that became the smoothie box experience of working with Vin and his, his partner, Justin. And, and basically, we got to the point where I was trying to work on my health. Uh, I was trying to help the business grow. And we became incredibly good friends as a result of that. So how was that experience for you standing on stage with, Mo with Molly and Ezra, Vin? So hindsight 2020, it was fantastic. That Barcelona trip, you know, I didn't actually meet you there. I don't know no, if you remember that. We, exactly. we didn't leave the trip. We actually didn't shake hands or anything there. But Nick Shackelford was there, Tim Bird, there, the, Mikhail from SMS Bump. There was an interesting group there that I'm still connected with, Eric Taz. From my perspective, you had sent me what I thought was an incredibly insightful uh, video, the Clay Christensen Jobs to be Done Theory, and I had not been familiar with it. And for those that aren't familiar, click the link because it's a seven minute video or so. I, I've probably watched it, you know, close to a hundred times, certainly shared it a lot, but you shared that video. I found it incredibly insightful. And as you said, that kicked off a conversation, which kicked off an engagement, which kicked off a friendship. We ended up, we met in Barcelona and you came to Florida. We, we ended up in Vegas at one point. Yep. And then it's back so, to Florida. So yeah. I think, so, so again, just interject Vin. So Vin, I, like I, I've yeah. been involved in affiliate marketing a long time. I said, look, I've got some really cool friends. I think pr this smoothie bro product would be a really good play for affiliates. So we, we made arrangements to meet up back in Vegas for affiliate summit. What was really quite interesting was that because Vin was living in Florida, I don't think you owned a pair of casual long trousers. So you had to go and buy long trousers to travel yeah. to Vegas. I, I, just, <laughs> I did. I. I had my winter clothes were up north because we had moved to Florida when my dad got sick. And uh, yeah, I had no trousers or slacks. So I still, and, and I've been in Florida long enough. I, I, I still don't like it. And, and it's funny. I, I remember the, the first venture out in your khaki pants that you bought. I was walking behind you and you still had the sticky label down the back of the legs where they put, then you <laughs> like whipped up behind you and just pulled the label off the, the trousers. Which I, again, I yeah, that's that sounds right. We went to Vegas. We hung out a bit more and introduced it into some friends. We, the, the the friendship became stronger and stronger as a result of that. I went back to the UK. 
We then agreed that I was going to go back out again to try and spend a little bit longer with you. We were looking ideally at the, at, at the time to probably look to get me involved in on a sort of full-time basis to help out with some of the online marketing side of things. So for me, it was a, a fairly big life decision that I was looking to make. So Vin was very gracious, put us up in a very nice VRBO on the beach, my, flew my wife out. We had a phenomenal time, got to meet his family, his kids. I always remember watching your son sitting on the pitch, basically filling up his, his glove full of sand and then watching these kids play and how bad the, the parents were towards you. I'm thinking, you've given up your time, you're coaching, and they're just giving you complete sh- yeah. time. Welcome. Welcome to American Volunteer Sports. And I could see you getting yeah, wild was- up by these parents. I'm thinking he's going to launch himself at one of these parents any minute now. Since I've last seen you, I, I did. I ended up coaching soccer and got into it with a couple of parents. It's hard enough that I'm like, I just said to my wife the other day, I love the kids, but I can't, I can't deal with the parents. Coaching's not for me. Yeah, I think competitive parents will always be the bane of any coach's life. Yeah, I'm like an advocate and protector for kids. So I go a bit overboard. When these overbearing parents come in, it's like on someone your own size. Not a good mixture. So we, we got to the point where we, we were about to fly up to Boston, where the main investor of the business was based. I said to my wife, I wanted to meet, meet the main guy, look him in the yeah, eyes, yep. see what things were like, see if he liked me, see if we liked them. We even had flights booked to go, go up. And I think we were, I don't know if we were like a, an hour or so away from heading towards the airport and you received a call to basically say, we just had our first case of COVID. Don't come. Do you remember that? I I do. I I remember getting really sick in Vegas and leaving a day early and thinking I might have had an early COVID. And but you came, I feel like a few months later. And there I, I don't remember the specifics, but I, I remember there being this hurriedness to make a decision. Yep. It's like it's like that old song, do we stay or do we go now? And, and it was like, Jim, are you going to get on the plane or, or are you going to stay? Yeah. And there was a real sort of angel devil on the shoulders sort of situation that, that really felt like a fork in the, well, and I think hindsight 2020, it absolutely was a fork in the road. Yeah. Cause I think uh, we, for both we, of our we, we had been told by Virgin, we were flying with Virgin Atlantic and we were being told that there were no more flights out of Orlando. Like we were on the second to last flight out of Orlando. And I, I, I remember saying to my wife, right. go and split the tickets so I can stay and you can go back. And I remember sitting in the hotel and you, I think you were there in the hotel room at the time and I had tears running down my face because I was like, I want to stay, I want to stay. I, I, but but at the same time, this is this seemed like a fairly scary thing, but I was like, you know what? It'll be a couple of weeks. We'll sort it all out and we'll be back out. And none of us knew that it was going to be, what was it, like nearly two years before things really got back to, I, I, even now, I don't even think things are back to normal, normal now. I think they're just about there. Uh, you could travel certainly, but, but you would have been stuck here. I, I, I vaguely remember it coming down to the American healthcare system Yeah, where you're like, I'm on, I take a certain medicine and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to source it. And I mean, we were really sort of sharpening the pencil to say, is there any way that you could stay? Not knowing that COVID was going to sort of, at that point, wasn't COVID still a giant question mark? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's it's still a, kill us all or, yeah. even or be a flu. Even declared a pandemic, we weren't really sure how long it was going to be. And like I said, I, I genuinely thought, I was going to jump on a plane back to the UK, two or three weeks, it'd all be finished. We yeah. jump back on a plane, yeah. get back out there and pick up where we left off so, and consummate the, the decisions and of what we'd actually made at that particular point in time in the run up to that. But obviously we didn't get it done. Yep. COVID, COVID was what COVID was. And we got to the point where we, we went our separate ways. I think you decided that there, you needed somebody physically there. I f- wasn't able to be physically there. So we just went our separate ways. And, and for me, I was, I was devastated at the loss of the business opportunity, but I was probably more hurt by the fact that I wasn't going to be able to see somebody who'd become a good friend of mine. And I wanted to continue that friendship. Your wife had gone on well with my wife. I'd loved your kids. It's, there, was, there was so much for 
the relationships that we we built up in that relatively short space of time because you came across such a genuine person. So let's let's pick things up for the the benefits of the podcast. What's happened to you since then? Because obviously since then a lot has changed in in your kind of situation. You became a father again, is that right? Yes. In COVID, while we were sort of stuck in in the house as getting older and whatnot, my wife and I were like, hey, should we have one more child? This is we we have two and and we're really enjoying it and and life's good and and we're home a lot. If we're gonna be home a lot, let's fill this home with kids. And so let's have one more. And one more became two more because they were twins. And that was a big shock in a huge change of lifestyle that we're still feeling. They turned three in February. I just turned 45 and they have endless energy and they're awesome babies. When I, when you were out here, there was Bella and Buddy yep. pretty much. And they're now turning nine and 10, but, but yes, we had, we had kids sold, sold the house that you, that you had dinner over and moved into a bigger place for, for more space. At the time that I was there with you guys, you were working with Smoothie Box, but I understand you're now doing something else. Tell me a little bit more about what you're up to now. So should I talk about the end of Smoothie Box or like, yeah, I mean, or just now, no, just so to segue from, from you to the end of, of, of Smoothie Box, Smoothie Box in a lot of ways was a search for conviction, product market fit, as you would call it, wrestling with personas and really finding the messaging that would work and the jobs to be done theory. Daily Harvest was, was doing incredible work and growing at an incredibly fast rate, rate venture back. And so we knew there was a market there, but we were having trouble sort of unlocking it. I, I, was, I struggled I unlocking you know, the, the, the business being described as sort of like Amazon, but for, for fresh, fresh food. So it's the, the supply chain lead time for putting the ingredients together was sometimes 18 to 24 months. So actually deciding how much of a particular product you needed, you, it wasn't a case of, well, let's just throw another five of them together. Now you needed to think 18 months, 24 months ahead because you had to grow the ingredients okay. in different countries and then have it all shipped in and, and everything else. So it wasn't as simple as, as some people's businesses are in terms of putting it all together. I, I, I got to a point, I guess the succinct version of the story was, was a, a VC sent me a deal to get my opinion on. And, and it was a, it was a hand cream with incredibly high margins. And it wasn't perishable and had a high repurchase rate and they weren't offering a subscription. It was really a sweet business. And, and I was looking at how thin the margins were at Smoothie Box, how hard perishable frozen is in the United States, just because of how large of a landmass we have to care to cover in a short period of time before the ice melts. And so one of the things that I just, I, I lost appreciation for the additional challenges of perishable e-commerce. I always remember when we went up to Jacksonville, where you had one of your distribution centers, where they put the boxes together. So the orders would come in, they would be sent to the distribution center. And I remember we went up there and we absolutely froze our balls off in this where these guys were putting in dry ice into the box and you had a dry ice formula that would actually say how much ice needed to be put in depending on where the p particular house was located because obviously yeah. if you put a box of smoothies on somebody's doorstep and it's 110 outside that's going to be thawed in 10 minutes 15 minutes unless there's a certain quantity of drop oh my god because a lot of people would just have it thrown onto the doorstep and be, it wouldn't be left there until they got home and sometimes that could be six seven hours later so there was so many moving parts that particular business, which made the logistics of it so much more difficult. And the, the daily harvest model was always like, how much discount should we give somebody to buy it to begin with? And I can't remember, I, I know you and I butted heads on many occasions when I was talking about, in order to get people to repeat buy, they need to consume what you've sent them to begin with. We were talking about right. the bonding sequence of the email, say, hey, here's a recipe you can make this particular smoothie with, this particular smoothie with, because if they didn't consume it, they're going to go, you sent me another box. I've got no room in my freezer and I don't want to have it anymore. Yeah, you were right. <laughs> yeah, there was a, cons so, and the freezer is a hidden spot in, in your house. So consumption was a challenge that we needed to address and didn't address effectively. Yeah. 
argue. And, and we're at the point now where at the beginning of the year, a lot of people will, will be doing their New Year's resolutions. They'll have joined the gym. And some of them will just probably say, a member of the gym for a couple of months, not go. They'll pay the monthly subscription for the gym. And then eventually they'll get a bank statement and go, why am I paying 80 bucks for a gym that I'm not going to? And really, that's where I think the subscription models sometimes fall down is people renew almost by accident. They, they forget that they've got it. And then eventually they realize they have. Whereas I think the, the businesses that are proactive in actually going out there and trying to, to continually put themselves out there in front of people to say, hey, you've got this, this gym, this smoothie membership, whatever it might be, you've got the ability to put that in front of people. And you need to put it in front of people frequently in order for them to remember that you exist. Exactly. And, and do you recall the blender experiment that we did to, to address the hidden smoothies and to encourage consumption? I do. How did that go? Were you on no. when we got sued? No. <laughs> <laughs> I dodged a bullet in there, I guess. We, so just, just for the value of your audience, the, the, there's a hypothesis or there was a, there was this feeling that the, the freezer is a hidden part of your kitchen or your house and that you, that we needed to provide a reminder to our customers to consume it. Just, just as Jim's talking about. So we thought what better way than to, than to sell a blender. The other thing was our smoothies required and then. And you tell a funny story, Jim, about getting a smoothie from Justin, but versus I think my wife, but the blender really impacted the customer experience. It was a cheap blender. It had a grainy smoothie, but it, but it we had a high quality or commercial blender, it got velvety smooth. And so we thought let's sell a high quality one and we sourced one in India from another guy that was speaking on stage in Barcelona, Sam, and he had it infringed on intellectual property. I would say arguably, my attorney thought maybe inarguably. Right. <laughs> and, and so a prominent blunder company sent the cease and desist and, and we did. Because I was sitting on say $50,000 worth of blunders about a year later, I thought, yeah, I, I bet we could spark this up again. And the week I turned it back on, they said, whoa, you, you screwed up. I told you cease and desist and you you, you started up again. And so now it was sort of penalty phase and they wanted us to throw all 50,000 dump blenders into a dumpster. Wow. And we ended up negotiating, sending them to a troubled woman's center because just the thought of throwing them out made no sense, mm-hmm. just the waste. So we, we agreed to donate them to charity, but, uh, but yeah, so we, we learn these lessons. You uh, it's a lesson to learn. Your lessons. Yeah. Your lesson, your, the main lesson of consumption is absolutely spot on when you're in a perishable business. And I think just to piggyback on something you said earlier, I think if a lot of subscription businesses are, are being really honest, there's some aspect of wanting to fly under the radar. Oh, there's sometimes an aspect of wanting to be forgotten or to pri- to be at a price where you may fly under the bank statement radar. Um, to get a couple extra months. I think that I've certainly met a few, more than a few people that have that cooked into their business. Yeah. I mean, I, I, always remember, I always remember at one point in time, I'm, I was sort of a pay search business and it was, it was the wild west back then. My philosophy was if you're not getting cease and desist letters, you're not trying hard enough. Whereas I think clearly we're, we're way beyond that point now. I think that it's an expensive lesson to learn. So obviously you had the $50,000 worth of blenders yeah. you had to give away to, to a worthy home. So what, what kind of happened then? Yep. All right. So, so the business just stabilized in COVID. We didn't see this huge spike in business. There was some, there was some growth, but we weren't necessarily prepared to capitalize. Part of the reason was for what you said, you had to forecast so far in ahead. I'll just skip a sort of ahead, we ended up getting pursued by a global meal prep company. So they didn't have breakfast on their offerings. They were, they were a dinner meal prep company and they were looking at adding smoothies. And so we started to get into the acquisition exit conversations and through that 
my, I mentally exited. I was like, okay, we're getting to the end and I'm going to have an exit event. We're going to cash out and, and I've got to figure out tax consequences. And that's where my mind was. And during the conversations, Daily Harvest had a major, Daily Harvest and the Revive Superfoods had a major health issue. I don't know if, if that news made it, but they had a, they had a product that they launched through affiliates and influencers. That product made the influencers sick. Wow. I, I think some significant, so maybe even, even argue, you know, allegedly could have caused a death and major lawsuits. And, and so all of a sudden we were the number three smoothie company and, and it looks like number one and two are on uh, shaky ground. So we hit this just really fascinating situation and we got it to an exit. We negotiated a deal and it really, I said, I would say without getting into the details too, too much, the, there was a conversation that, that me and the CEO had, which was. What if we invested, there's a tax consequence to this exit. What if we took that bill and applied it to growth? Yeah. So I'm make up, I'm going to make up numbers. Let's say the tax bill is a million dollars. What if we took a million dollars and put it in the market? Well, Jim, as you would know, because you saw the inside, that would have changed everything if using a, a large sum of money. in. so now the question was, geez, can I stomach the tax bill when I think I can actually grow this business further? My stance was I mentally had exited. So it was like, so the CEO's, CEO's name is Mike. It was like, Mike, you have my support to do anything you want and I'll help transition if you decide to keep it. But, but I'm moving on. I, I had already moved on yeah. mentally, and I had already started uh, sort of my next. And, and so he ended up keeping it, it moved back up to Boston and, and it's, it's now sort of, now butcher box has sort of become a bit of a portfolio company. They have smoothie boxes as a subsidiary and they just launched butcher box pets. And for anyone that's interested in subscriptions, I, I think it's a churn reduction strategy in the sense that if you're getting your food for your humans and your pets, it's nice that you're less likely to churn or you're more like more frequent. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's, I think it's, I think it's an active hypothesis, but yeah. So, and then not to get too rambly, but I, I've been doing some consulting and one of the areas, Jim, that really you and I, I think also butted heads on, and I really appreciated butting heads with you because it, it was always respectful. It wasn't it, it was sort of, you're definitely the market, but was on content, blog content. And I, I, I forget the names, but you would suggest writers to us to study who were brilliant writers. Do you remember, was it, was it Roland Frazier or? Yeah. I mean, I, I think like you, I mean, again, you've got Gary Halbert and, um, yep. John Caples, Eugene Schwartz, John Carlton. I mean, there's some, some amazing content writers. Totally. So you had sort of educated us on, Hey. Don't do content for the sake of content. If you're going to do it, do high quality, do it meaningful. This isn't a box that you check. And while we wrestle, nothing, we publish nothing. And I think, and I, so, I think one yeah. of the reasons we butted heads was I was like, let's just get something out there. And you were like, no, it needs to be like so good, so good, so good. And, and I think in, in a lot of cases, sometimes it is better to be just get it out there and then refine it, right? But at the same time, like, I think some people just sit and do nothing at all. And I think something is better than nothing. Better quality is better than poor quality. But at the same time, I, I think agree. a lot of people just do nothing at all. Well, and that's like needing an action bias, just, just doing it and then, and then improving it. And so we absolutely got stuck in not publishing. And so content really, and more than just smoothie box has always been a murky ROI for me. And it's like, how do you do it? Well, we got to strategize it. It's got to have a content uh, calendar. It's got to be managed. It's got to be in sync with the larger marketing message. It's got to complement churn reduction. It, it's got to be part of the, the nurturing phase. And, and so there's all these things that we wrestle with. Oh, also it's got to be good for SEO. Oh, it's got to be edited. It's got to be approved. It's got to go through some editorial con control. Then lastly, you got to give it to the tech guys to install it. 
And at the end of 2022, like most people, I was playing around with chat GPT. And although there are major, major flaws with it for written content and SEO and, and Google, there are some sort of incredible benefits that we, that we found doing tests. And so I created a hypothesis, which was, can we use sophisticated prompts progression? So we pull data out of Shopify via the API and plug it into a sophisticated prop progression to create really high impact blogs that can increase search rankings, domain authority, topical authority, and organic search traffic and ideally right. And so we created content X it's, it's mainly powered by chat GPT, which I think is like a Ferrari motor when it comes to my tech ability, my tech it ability is like a, a stone put wheel. So to have a, have access really affordably to, to something like chat GPT has made my software look far more sophisticated than it otherwise would. And so content X, you can just pick how many blogs you want per month. You can set it and forget it, or you can do a manual mode. You can have them save to draft or publish automatically. It writes the metadata, it writes the excerpts, it hyperlinks back to your product display page. And our early hypothesis is that it's, is that it's performing ranking and indexing well. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I always think like system. additional content, cause you have your, your product the display pages there. They're great for when people are actually in credit card, they've got the credit card in their hand, they wanted to buy, they're deciding whether they want a blue or a black one, but most often people that that you want to talk to higher up the funnel. And unless you've got content that kind of sits in that playground, you're never really going to get them. And that's, that's always the challenge. I think a lot of certainly direct to consumer people, they focus on the checkout, the, the payment gateways, all that sort of stuff. And there's so much more that kind of can sit in front of that, that helps to explain a little bit more about what the problems it solves. It's again, it, it goes back to the, the job to be done. What is the job to be done? And I think that's where I think some, some well thought through prompts that can write content about a particular topic with a decent LLM will, will do really well. And I'm really interested and intrigued to see how you fare in the Shopify ecosystem, because again, I mean, I love the whole ecosystem. Shopify good at what they do. They realize they're not going to be the best at everything. So they, they partner with other people who have developed bolt-ons or add-ons that kind of sit to help add value to people that want to become like a, a seller of a particular product. I had experience of that through the HubSpot ecosystem, but with Shopify, it's a completely different ecosystem, but does broadly speaking, the same sort of thing. To speak to your direction on, on writers and writers of high quality, one of the things that stood out to me, Jim, and, and I should have reached out to you in real time was that I remember doing early prompt experiments and telling ChatGPT to act like the author you encouraged us to maybe emulate or follow their style. And I was just blown away that in 15 seconds, it did so much better of a job at what I had asked it to do than I had done in a three month period. Yeah, I mean, I've been a- And and that was where- I've definitely been a dabbler with ChatGPT. I mean, I've used it for- I know some people that use it for everything, right? But I've used it for rewriting bios. If I'm going to go and speak at a conference, I look at my bio and go, wow, that's really horrible. And I'll just say, hey, can you give me write three or four different variations of that? And it'll give me three or four variations. And, and again, I'll probably Frankenstein monster it. I'll say, I like that bit, like that bit and pull them all together. So yeah, I definitely think there's, there's mileage in kind of pulling all that together. Yeah. And, and, and that's a good use example. I don't, I don't think chat GPT is sort of the answer to a lot of things, but it is good for, I don't let it write my LinkedIn posts, but I write my LinkedIn posts and put it through it and say, Hey, where are there opportunities to remove some words? Where can I add some emojis? How can I organize posts better? And then I, it feels to me like it comes out with better than I do. Yeah. And, and I, I, I look at this, I mean, we're, we're recording a podcast episode. And again, podcast is a new thing for me. It's something that I, I just had a little bit of time on my hands and I wanted to see, I, I think for anyone that's sort of listening, I spent the whole of th- uh, 2023 walking more than 10,000 steps a day and I wanted a new challenge for 2024 and I've adopted becoming a podcaster as part of that. And again, it's, it's always one of those things. 
you'll read the, the, the kind of the Jay Klauses, Jay Acunzo, you know, there's loads of different people, Amy Porterfield, who are making tens of millions of dollars, like as podcasters, great, fantastic. But for every one of those, there's like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who are making no money at all as a podcaster. And all they're doing is spending money on all the podcast bolt-ons that kind of help add different things to what you do as a podcaster. So it, there's all the different bits that will, will help you with getting guests and all that sort of, the, the ecosystem that pulls it all together. And if you fill your business with the right tools and people to help support it, then I think it'll, it'll go well for you if, if you put the effort in. Similarly, I think in, in the, the, the line of work that you're in, there's, again, probably tens of thousands of people that have got Shopify add-ons. And I think a lot of it is the way in which you position it. It's not even so much what it does. It's like how you position it and who can become your champions that will take it and move, move forward with it and give you the anecdotal case studies to be able to then say, hey, this is phenomenal and you should use it. So again, if you had a, a big Shopify store that you use your app and then you got a referral re review or what have you, that could be game changing in terms of what 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 you have, as it was when when Smoothie Box yep. we had the the emails that would go out from Butcher Box, and as soon as they put the Smoothie Box thing back on their their email sequence, all of a sudden the orders were coming flooding through because there was huge amounts of volume there. And again, it seemed like a such an innocuous and simple way of generating incremental revenue, but but I understand the reasons why people may not necessarily want to put it in there because they're potentially cannibalizing or plagiarizing their, their existing business that they have. Yeah. Although they, they have since added a marketplace where, I, at, where they leaned into it. And so now they do offer other products that I think probably, I would assume take a cut of those, those re you just get in on the action versus not do it. One of the thoughts that I, would, that I was thinking, Jim, was that there are a ton of small stores out there and it's hard to get a good ROI on, on content, especially when some of these things are hypothesis that might take six or nine months to, to sort of play out as you see how Google indexes in and, and how it reacts. SEO is just a slow, a slower game. So one of my goals was, was not to create sort of a, a thing to replace your content team, but maybe a thing that can create a lot of foundational content, topical authority. And, and as you said, not everyone's ready to click and buy. And, uh, I think a, a lot of DTC stores lack that supportive content for other parts of the buying journey. And, um, and so my hope at, and if bootstrap, I don't need it to be, I don't have VCs telling me to hit targets and, uh, it doesn't need to be huge to be uh, a good sort of lifestyle app. You're a brilliant marketer. There, there are so many apps for sale that I could see you, you scale them on to the moon. It's not, again, I, I've always like worked on the, on, I know the things I'm good at and I know the things I'm not good at. And people have always said to me, oh, I'm frightened to tell you all this stuff because you could become my competitor. I'm like, pr I promise you there is no way on earth I'm ever going to become a direct to consumer store owner. I mean, it just doesn't float my boat at all. I mean, you mentioned Nick, Nick's got his fingers in yeah. 50 different businesses. He's, he's competing with himself in a lot of cases. I don't know how he has had time to get married, how he's had time to get his whole body <laughs> covered in tattoos, but it, he has, he's clearly doing something better in terms of time management than I ever would be able to. <laughs> right. But, I, but I think from, from the point of knowing, knowing what you're, what you're good at, not knowing what you're not good at. Again, I, I think that was, that was always one of the things I knew what I was capable of. You and I butted heads a little bit because there was this who's in charge here and everything else. And for me, it was always you were in charge, but sometimes I didn't like the direction that you were going. And rather than just accepting that, I would always fight my corner because I think sometimes that's, that's the healthiest way you've got of ensuring that you arrive at the right place or you accept the, the kind of the outcome of the conversation that's taken place. And, and, and sometimes I'd be right sometimes, but I'd be wrong. And if I was wrong, I'd be the first to admit that I was wrong and we'd move on. But at, at the same time, I would hate to follow somebody to a particular destination that you know was going to end up hurting Definitely. the business or people or whatever it might be. I'd rather fight the corner, dig the heels in and say, no, we're not going down there than to end up there and go, oh, at the end of it, go, 
told you that it was, it, that wasn't a good thing to do. Yep. That, that would be pointless. There's no, there's no totally. action in sort of standing there and totally. looking at the end of it. Yeah, 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 yep. yeah. No, there it's yeah. Interesting perspective. Interesting perspective. That one of the challenges from my side was was running smoothie box that at times felt like I was fixing a plane while flying it. And I started the role thinking I had been a pilot and a mechanic, but when I, when you really unpacked it, I had it. I had owned a web agency and I had been affiliated with a lot of success, but I hadn't been the direct catalyst for it. So then all of a sudden with, with full responsibility, that was really why I flew up to Spain was, was to like get some vision and, and clarity. What it created was a situation, which I'll never do again, which, which was like me learning in front of a live studio audience. And so feeling like I had the consequence of the decisions, but not the knowledge. Now, a smart guy get, if you're a B player, you bring in an A player and you delegate to them. And that's, that's maturity. I think I'm just getting now that it's no, 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 you got to just, you got to delegate. Jim's the brilliant marketer. Even if he's wrong, his call is better than yours. It's funny. And um, you, you mentioned and, the you, you bearing your soul on stage. I mean, I still, from time to time, will rewatch my video because obviously I spoke about Google Ads, and I watch, and I'm, I'm horrified at how big I was and how sweaty I was because I, I again, I I just couldn't cope with the the bulk that I was carrying at the time. And I watched your video and again, I absolutely admired your humility, bearing your soul to Ezra and Molly to, to get some ideas on what, what you could do with the business. But yeah, I mean, for, for me, Vin, like I said, I, I, I was truly, truly touched by the, the generosity and friendship that we had when, when you kind of shared your, your family with me and, and, and I introduced you to my wife and introduced you to some of my affiliate friends and we had some of them come down to, to, Clearwater and we went out for dinner. We had a great time. Again, for me, I, I've always said that they're not, they're not my friends. They're everyone's friends. And I'm happy to make those introductions. I think so many people are trying to be sort of self-centered, keep everything to themselves. And I'm like, I just don't think that the, the world of business works that way. The more you share, the more you get back in, in return, for sure. I, do you remember me complimenting you on that? I used to compliment your generosity with your Rolodex. You were, you, you're, and, and I've come to learn that it's an abundance mindset where you think there's, there's just plenty to go around. So why wouldn't you be super inclusive? And, but that always super struck out to me about you and everywhere we went, obviously there's this sort of legend of Jim Banks that, that Bad decisions uh, with Jim Banks. You know, <laughs> Echo in the, in the whispered halls of the chandelier bar in Vegas and secret pizza. But the, the, I, I was always genuinely impressed with your openness, with your other long-term friendships related. It, it seems like everyone you've done business with, you become friends with, which I think is pretty telling. Yeah. And, and to the type of guy. And, and it's funny. I, I, I always, whenever I travel on business, people always say, are you on business or pleasure? And I always say, well, to me, there's no difference. The kind of two go hand in hand. I always find when I'm on a business trip, I will quite happily make friendships and there'll be like lifelong friendships in a lot of cases and we'll have good times and we'll have a few drinks and we'll make some bad decisions. Equally, when I go socially, sometimes the social stuff, if I go away on a family vacation, quite often I'll meet people. I met, I met a great guy recently here in the local town where I live. I just this guy happened to be sitting reading a book outside a wine bar. I got chatting to him. He's he's involved in the industry, and I'm a sort of stalker on LinkedIn now. Watch all of the stuff that he's done. But at some point in time, we yeah. will, we will have the opportunity to meet again at the wine bar, so we can catch up and see what see where where he's going within his business. But yeah, I mean, I, I just think, but I'm never I'm never looking for what's the return financially for me. So for me, if I make an introduction of you to somebody else. I don't go, where's my cut? What are you going to give me? I just do it because right. law of reciprocity. I just do good things and hopefully good things will come back my way. And generally Ooh. speaking, they have. And that's, that's all I've ever tried to do. And that, and that, I don't know, that's like, when I think of you, that 
that's the first thought that comes up. I mean, first is sort of brilliant marketer, but the other one is, is sort of jovial connector and incredible storytelling. I, 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 one thing that I miss about, about seeing you more often and just chatting was, was the stories. You've got incre in, in, incredible stories. You tell them in an incredible manner. I think that's part of your marketing prowess is, is, is your ability to tell a story effectively. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, you say, um, you say yeah, that, you know, I, I, I become, again, I become not obsessed. I, I don't think obsessed is the right word, but I become very aware of the whole, the premise of trying to become a YouTuber and people say, you need a three second hook. You got to cook them in, in the first three seconds, have great titles and thumbnails. And I agree. I think I tell a good story, but the stories can sometimes be quite lengthy. And I don't think unless you have the ability to get them in, in the first place, it, let's say click on the, the title and thumbnail, you're not going to get them into the story ever. I could be telling the best stories in the world, but if people aren't going, oh, that looks quite interesting. I'm going to dive into that one. You never know. So I think sometimes, yes, you have the ability to tell a good story, but you also need to be able to hook them in to begin with. And that's probably yep. the thing I think has probably been one of my Achilles heels. I mean, once we get going, ah. I'm fine, but it's just getting the hook in the, in the, and the mouth and hooking them in to begin with is, is always the hardest bit. I, I have an opinion on who I think does this brilliantly. Yeah. And it, it's a YouTube channel called Vin Wiki. Are you, are you oh, familiar with that? No, I'm not, but I'm going to be after this. Vin Wiki tells car stories. So if you're a car guy, he, he interviews car, car people and, but he'll take like the best 10 seconds and lead the whole podcast with it. And it'll go something like this. And that's why Ferraris catch on fire. And then it goes into the podcast. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> Did this guy just say the Ferrari caught on fire? And now I'm listening to the whole podcast to hear the story behind the Ferrari that caught on fire. Yeah. Wait, yeah, I think does a brilliant job of pulling out hooks on their podcasts. And look at that Hot Wings. The Hot Wings where they interview people with escalating hot. Oh, yeah. I saw Nick Shackleford would do that. He, he looked very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, yeah yeah there's they, all email to you when it comes co comes to me but they they do good pulling out what's it oh my gosh ezra <laughs> okay ezra firestone boom cosmetics yeah. he used to tell a story he told it in spain yeah. of interviewing his clients and this one woman said i walked in and my husband said Wow. And then like, he just sort of picked that thing and ran an ad in it. Yeah. It ran gang, uh, gangbusters. But I, th I think you're brilliant, man. I, I think of the Viagra story. I've told that story a bunch of times <laughs> from, a, from an advertising perspective. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't know. I would go with your gut over. Everyone says it on these podcasts and YouTube channels, oh, you need a thumbnail. You need to look like you got a shocked face. You got to point at something. You got to have an arrow. It's like, I've done, oh, so now I go on YouTube, all the thumbnails look the same. Yeah. And, and I'm tempted to do it because everyone says it works, but I just feel like your gut, man, if I'm Jim Banks, I'm going with my gut. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think there's probably a little bit of, I probably need to be a little bit closer to what is considered to be best practice and less what's good for me. But at, at the same time, like I said, I have. I have zero expectations around the whole podcasting thing. For me, it's just, I, again, it's a new thing. I wanted to see how it all fits together. Because again, I think so many businesses, it helps to personalize what they do. It helps to peel back the onion a little bit, see a few layers deep into what's going on. I mean, the whole bad decisions with Jim Banks. I, I was sitting at the parasol up and down bar with some friends and this friend of mine, Rob Snell, he said, Jim, you should have your own TV show and it should be called Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. You just seem to make all these like dreadful decisions about different things. And, and, and I, I, like it stuck with me ever since then. So quite often if I'm sitting doing something, I mean, again, I, I always recount the story of sitting playing blackjack with some Spanish people at seven in the morning and I'm on stage at nine o'clock in the morning speaking at a conference. The only reason we were able to communicate with the Spanish people on the table is we could all count up to 21 and we all knew when somebody had won. I didn't understand the word they were saying. They didn't understand the word I was saying. Oh, we were yeah. having a great time and high-fiving each other. And I'm sitting there going, this yeah. is a really bad decision to be sitting here at seven o'clock in the morning playing blackjack. So consequently, I don't do any. If I ever go to Vegas, you will never see me playing cards or anything like that ever. It just, just, just 
doesn't happen for that reason. Well, I will, I love the premise. Of course, I was familiar with the hashtag, just, <laughs> just knowing you. And, and I, I think as the podcast developed, I think there's a real opportunity for people to actually share bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Man, but I, yeah, me, I, you know, what I really screwed up was, was I, I, I got paralyzed. Jim, Jim was telling me we gotta, we gotta be action biased. And I was, and I was stuck in perfection. I think there's so much sort of back slapping, especially on LinkedIn of, of, of all the, the DTC sort of marketers of, Hey, and, and some of it's good. Hey, this is what's working for me. It does come across as a bit of a humble brag at, at times and, and mine as well. But the real lessons, at least in business for me, have been the screw ups, the things that I go, yeah, I never want to do that again. And, and honestly, one of them is perishable food. I, I'm like, I, I just don't appreciate the extra challenge. Business is hard on its own. Why, why do I need these additional challenging variables of spoilage? Yeah. Carrier of, um, carrier of reliability. How much dry ice to put in there? I mean, it's, and again, we have this kind of situation where there's all this global warming. I mean, again, some of the, 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 the smoothie flavors would be, they would have pineapple in them and you'd have to rely on the pineapple stock being available when you wanted to have it. And if a whole place got wiped out by a fire or something like that, then you could end up like having a shortage of that particular product and people just wouldn't appreciate it. And the flip side of that coin, talk about a bad call. We had an 18 wheeler full of avocado puree, which it spoils a took point. And our velocity of sales, we, we over forecast. So all of a sudden I'm trying to, on the secondary market, sell an 18 wheeler full of avocado. And it's not even close to any of my skill sets. I'm like, I'm laying in bed thinking, how the hell am I going to get rid of all this avocado? Yeah. There ended up, that would be, a, we ended up selling to a, a story about. company. That would definitely be a difficult one to tell. Story That's yeah. 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 So it's just, it's. It's, I'm so appreciative. I, I feel like 80% of my marketing foundation came, came from you. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I again, like, like I said, for me, like the, the whole experience I had with meeting you guys and spending time with you and spending time with your family and seeing what a genuinely nice guy, family guy, heart in the right place, good business ethics really looked after people. There are not very many people with the qualities that you possess in this world. So again, I'm, I'm very grateful to have you as a friend and I'm, I'm glad that we got the opportunity through this podcast. If nothing else, I've managed to reconnect with, with a good friend and I'm very grateful for that. That's mighty kind to say. Uh, I agree with all that. I agree with everything you said. This, this has been a wonderful morning for me. Good. Well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the people listening to the podcast to the rest of their days. Thank you so much for uh, being on with me. And uh, hopefully at some point in time, we get the opportunity to reconnect face to face. I might have some microphones with me and we can maybe do some impromptu bad decisions with Jim Banks on the fly interviews. That'd be great. That'd be fantastic.